So today on In My Life, I'm very pleased to be joined by author, journalist and broadcaster, Leslie Ann Jones. Leslie Ann, welcome. Thank you very much. So tell me, what was your earliest memories of the Beatles? Well, uh, the Beatles were pretty much over and done with by the time I was aware of them. I came in at Wings and discovered the Beatles backwards, which I think that must be a, a common thing among lots of us who we just weren't born in time. You know, we didn't uh, experience the Beatles in real time. And so I, I think My Love was the first single I heard on the radio. And that sent me scuttling to Red Rose Speedway, which became a massive favourite album of mine. And then I think the next birthday I had, somebody gave me the, the red and the blue albums. And of course, so many hits on there, uh, which led me to discovering the albums. Not all of them came from albums, of course, the, the tracks on there, but most of them did. And all of them were Lennon-McCartney compositions, none of which meant anything to me at the time. All of that interest and fascination and obsession with the Beatles came much later, really. So my entry was Wings and specifically Paul McCartney. Were there no Beatles albums or singles lying around your parents' house growing up? No, no. My parents, were, my mother wasn't really into music very much and my parents didn't listen to the radio. My dad travelled a lot for work. He was a sports writer on a national newspaper, so he was gone a lot. Uh, my mum was a telly person, so we didn't have the radio on. Um, the, the kind of music my father would buy, albums-wise, was... Um, Frank Sinatra, uh, Sammy Davis Jr., Dean Martin, Barbara Streisand, that kind of stuff. So it wasn't um, it wasn't ever the Beatles. I think they came too late for the Beatles, and I well no, they came too early, I suppose, and I came too late. That would be the way around. The Beatles were in the middle, and uh, there was no other fascination for them in my household. My brother came in at Elton John. And then there was a big gap bet between the first two children and the second two children. So then my my middle sister came in at David Cassidy. So, you know, we, we just fell between the stools somehow. Um, it's the way it was. And what about your own children? Are they carrying the flame for the Beatles and McCartney? Oh, they do. I've, they're all 20-somethings, um, recent graduates, and I've taken them to, I think, four... Paul McCartney gigs by now uh, every time he's in London I take them um, and they are massive fans I think probably of Paul more than the Beatles although now we know he he's back to being his own sort of greatest hits act isn't he really so there was a time especially at the beginning of Wings when I think right the way through Wings really when he wouldn't revisit any Beatles material at all he'd moved on from that and it was still a very raw period for him, I'm sure. Uh, but now he's very happy to revisit the catalogues of both the Beatles and Wings, as well as his own solo music. And so they've had the whole range of it. They're much luckier than I was. And also, I pay, I pay for the tickets. <laughs> <laughs> Mum yeah. always pays for everything, of course. Yeah, yeah. So that brings us uh, neatly to your um, first song uh, you selected today, uh, which I believe Paul has never performed uh, live before. And it's from a criminally underrated album, which you mentioned before, Red Rose Speedway. And it closes outside one, the fantastic melodic genius of Little Lamb Dragonfly. So why did you select this one, Leslie Ann? As you rightly say, he's never performed it live. He never will. I shouldn't imagine he could do that vocally now. But uh, the first time I heard this track, I was blown away by it. And it resonated with me because just a few years earlier, I had been seriously ill and nearly lost my life. I had a burst appendix, which developed into peritonitis, which in those days, that was kind of it really, curtains. Not very many people survived peritonitis. I think more people do now, although it's still a serious illness. And of course, it wasn't caught soon enough. So I had emergency surgery over an Easter weekend. And uh, that was followed by three more operations. I was um, at death's door. I had the last rites read and so on. And I was in hospital for the best part of a year. And 
during that year, because I did survive, but I was still very ill, I got to read a lot. We couldn't listen to music in hospital in those days. Not that I was really old enough to want to do that as a as a thing that might save my sanity, as it were. But I did get to read a lot and I became very bookish during that year of my life. But then when this album came out, which I instantly fell for, I um, was mad about it. I still have the original copy. I still play it. That vinyl used to go with me everywhere. It's still got my name engraved on the back. Yeah. I'd, and it's very, very precious to me, that original copy. And I heard this and I heard, I've read about this since then, but I heard two songs in that song. I heard a song about a little lamb who I identified with, something frail and helpless, who couldn't save itself and who might very well get killed and laid on a plate and get scoffed, you know. I really identified with that creature. And the other creature I heard loudly and clearly was the dragonfly. And it only dawned on me afterwards that I was facing death and I was on my way to becoming that dragonfly who could fly away and, and inhabit the next dimension. And you know how deep and spiritual we get when we're young teenagers and, and it all kind of, all the pennies dropped at once. It all made sense to me. It People have said over the years, oh, this is yet another homage by Paul to John. It's a reaching out song to John. I hear George Harrison in that song as well. In fact, I, th I think the first bit of it, you know, it sort of opens with a sitar-ish sound. Mm -hmm. uh, it's got a very George-like vocal. That's Paul sounding like George. And then a bit later on, it, it sort of transforms. And people have criticized it like hell. The critics didn't like it at all, did they? But of course, critics... What do they know? That was another world to me when I was that age. I was just young and I didn't know anything about rock critics at all. Didn't even cross my radar. But um, I laughed what I heard. It resonated with me very deeply and it stayed with me. And I always longed to go along to see Paul McCartney perform live and hear him play this. He never has. He's never going to. But it doesn't stop me listening to it. And it always has me very close to the edge emotionally because I recall precisely how I felt lying in that hospital bed and feeling that I was about to die. And not even my mum, who loved me, or my dad, who was even more helpless, not even those people who who loved me more than anybody on earth, not even they could do anything to bring me back. I was on my way. I was nearly a dragonfly. And then I came back to be a lamb again. I think George, uh, I, I don't think he's been publicly quoted about that song, but I, I think he would very much have identified with the themes of rebirth and the spirituality nature of that, that, that entire song. But it came about by happenstance, really, didn't it? It's sort of two songs that were, in Paul's manner, wedged together, and the sort of the transition from the dying lamb to the rebirth of a, the dragonfly just all happenstance, it is, so it seems. Yeah, and I, I'm sure it was destined, predestined for the frog chorus era, the sort of post wings mm. um, cartoon uh, project that he had going, and it obviously right. never made it to that. But my eldest daughter would later come to be a huge lover of the frog chorus so we had that in those days it was a video and we had that video and we played it yeah. over and over she absolutely loved it and of course that brought that memory back for me as well that oh wow that song was supposed to be part of this you know um instead we got we all stand together which yeah they love to hate it don't they? it's not a bad song I think Little Dram Lamb Dragonfly would have been a bit too deep for the Rupert project, really. I think it's a bit, a bit wasted. Really. Oh, definitely. And also for children, you know, it would have been right over their heads. But um, by the time you hit sort of mid-teens, getting off a of late teens and you're getting ready to leave home and become a student and all those things, a song like that gets deeper and deeper and you find yourself falling into it and and finding layer upon layer of meanings and nuances and things that probably Paul McCartney didn't actually mean for us to understand. But on the other hand, he would always say, if you hear it in whatever song, then it must be there, which is a classic poet's line. 
And it's got that lush George Martin orchestration as well, which uh, always elevates Paul's work to its highest level. Yeah, it's um, it's a wonderful conspiracy of magic, isn't it, really? Um, I've read uh, both the Dennis claiming that they helped Paul with uh, the lyrics in that song. I don't know if that's anything you've, you've unearthed uh, or can shed any light on in your research for your recent book. Not really. Um, no, there are theories, aren't there? And there are claims made after the fact. You can only go by the credits, really, although we know sometimes people do admit years later that this or that was intended or or it, it actually occurred. But there is no word from Paul on that, is there? I, I don't think they have any value because it was written in a time before he met uh, the two Dennis. So um, I think it's, but also it's credited officially to, to Paul and Linda. Uh, I'm, I think that was to avoid publishing, etc. But I'm not sure of Linda's contribution to this particular song. We'll never know now, will we? But um... The intention was, certainly at the beginning of the Wings era, that Linda would replace Paul. And to some extent, she really did. The whole concept of Wings was her idea in the first place, not the name. Mm. That occurred much later, but it was her idea. She was the one who said to Paul when he was in the depths of despair, on the verge of a nervous breakdown, you need to get back on the horse. And he said, what do you mean? And she said, you need to be in another band. You obviously can't do anything by yourself. So that's the only way you're going to get out of this is to do that. And he said, well, I can't. And at this point, he was they were up in Scotland on High Park Farm. He took to his bed, stopped shaving, um, stopped eating, took drugs, drank a lot, drank himself stupid. And she had a newborn baby, Mary, and her little girl from her first marriage, Heather, and this big baby in the bed who was refusing to get up and do anything, be a dad, occupy the children, help with feeding everybody, all of that. And Linda was going, what am I supposed to do with this? You know, they'd only been married about seven months at that stage. I felt really sorry for her. Um, it must have been ha hard and the public hated mm -hmm. her as well for taking Paul away from the Beatles, as was the perception at the time. But the fact is he said, I'll only do this if you do it with me, to a wife who had never learned to play an instrument, who'd never sung anything beyond a school choir. And suddenly now she's expected to partner one of the biggest musical artists in the world and to put herself out there, put her head above the parapet and subject herself to ridicule, which she certainly got. Such a strong-willed person and her contribution essential to the wing sound. No doubt about that. Yeah, and to all the people who said she couldn't sing, you know, some of her backing vocals are gorgeous. They're a bit cheesy on this track, I would say, I, I would dare to say, um, with her and Danny harmonising, her and Danny harmonising. And um, you think, yeah, it's a, you know, a little bit cheesy, but um, but it served its purpose and it worked for the time. And I think it, we always need to hold in the front of our minds, not even the back, the time period during which a song was conceived and then when it was recorded. It's really important to always bear that in mind. Indeed, and that brings us to your second selection now, which is going back to 1966. And I'm so pleased you picked this one because most people normally pick the B-side, Rain, but you've gone with Paperback writer, the uh, the A side, which is a song that might have been written about you. It makes you the Daily Mail, obviously, a, a periodical you spend a lot of time working on. So, uh, what? Why choose this one? It became a bit of a theme tune for me, actually. There's a picture in Flyaway Paul of me and Paul at the Lipper graduation in 2019, and the caption of that picture is the paperback writer and the writer of paperback writer, which I think is brilliant. And just to have the opportunity to be able to say that because it occurred to me years ago, but it's what I became. Um, I didn't necessarily set out to become an author, but I did want to get to Fleet Street. That was the aim in the early days. My father was there as a sports writer, uh, so I wasn't following in his footsteps necessarily, but. I loved that world. Fleet Street was a vibrant place in those days. 
uh, and all the, all the newspapers were were based there. They all had their their own printing uh, department, as it were, underneath the buildings, in the bowels of those great big old buildings. And you'd see the trucks coming out uh, from those huge exits with with all the newspapers on the back, ready to drive them all over the country. During half terms and holidays, I used to go with my dad up to, up to the paper. He worked on the Daily Mirror then, and then on the Sunday Mirror. His name was Ken Jones, uh, the, the voice of sport. And then years later, he moved to the Independent as a columnist when that newspaper was conceived. Uh, but I just wanted to get there. I thought this was, you know, the ambition of ambitions, really. And it was only while I was there, actually, as you say, working for the Daily Mail, which is mentioned in this song, that I thought, actually, I want a bit more than this, because a lot of your copy gets spiked on a newspaper. You can write, you'd be expected to turn in half a dozen stories a day. You'd be lucky if one of them would make print the next morning and that you would get what they called a decent show. But having written something and having crafted it, which is not really the idea in journalism, you've got to research it, you've got to get the quotes, you've got to bang it out to a deadline. And so it's not really about crafting prose. And then I realized that that's what I actually wanted to do. And that I would write nonfiction books. I wanted to write about real people. And my career as a journalist was taking me into show business more and more. I was traveling all over the world because we didn't have the internet at that point. So if you wanted an interview with Richard Gere or, I don't know, um, Dolly Parton, you had to get on the plane and go there. Uh, lots of the time that would be prearranged. They'd be expecting you. Some of the time they weren't and they'd be in the news for some reason. And you'd have to board that aircraft, find out where they lived or where they were working or where they were based and turn up and try to persuade them to talk to you. So all those skills that I acquired as a journalist, which were not nothing by any means, all of those had to be expanded in order for me to begin to write books about people. And I only ever had one rule for myself, which was that I wouldn't write books about people I wasn't passionate about. They would have to be somebody who touched my life in some way who I really wanted to get to know in depth and whose life I wanted to explore. And I wouldn't want to spend two years of my life with, with somebody I didn't have respect for, whose music I didn't like or, or whose films I wasn't into or whatever it was. So, so I was turning down at the beginning many more books than I would accept to write. But I did become the paperback writer. Obviously the books come out in hardback initially and then after about six months or a year, the publisher will then republish the paperback version. So this song is literally the story of my career. But your uh, paperbacks don't normally run to a thousand pages, give or take. No, I, very, very few. I mean, the age of the blockbuster has passed us by now. That's that's gone. And actually, books of much more than 100,000 words are not favoured by publishers now because that's probably about 300 pages, by the way, um, because they, they are very expensive to print. And nowadays books are printed up. It's not just your book on a printing press. A lot, a lot of the tech is digital now, of course, but it's not your, just your book in the frame. It's a lot of other people's books as well. And everything is timed very carefully. And if one book is significantly chunkier than another one, that isn't going to work with the printing process. So, um, yeah, the, the tech has taken over. It's taken over. It's a great, great thing. song as well. You've got uh, Paul's boosted Rickenbacker bass that really drives the whole thing along. And it was the first song that, uh, the first non love song, uh, for want of a better term, that the, the Beatles actually released as a single. Yeah, it's, um, it's a very upbeat song, but it's got a desperation to it. That's another aspect of it that I really like. That, you, you know, this guy is. I think, wasn't it Auntie Lil or somebody, Paul's Auntie That's Lil, right. who, who'd said to him, um, do you do you not write any songs about anything other than about love? You know, it's a bit boring. And so he set himself this, this task of coming up with a song that wasn't about love. And he happened to be backstage in some venue somewhere one time and saw Ringo reading a book and thought to himself, OK, if this story is true, it might be apocryphal, but maybe he did, maybe he didn't think, OK, I'll write a song about a book. 
which is a bit random, isn't it, really? But um, but that was the origin of the song, so they tell us. But Do it, you yeah. think Aunt, Aunt Lil criticised him for writing too many silly love songs? It could it actually could have been the inspiration for that song as well, couldn't mm-hmm. she? Could be. <laughs> but I mean, when you delve into song. these things, it's uh, yeah, yeah, it's like a rabbit yeah. hole, isn't it? It is. But silly love songs are popular because they're love songs, and uh, it's the universal craving, isn't it, to find the one, to identify with that one person, and to be on a wavelength with somebody who is your soulmate. Paul very obviously found that, and he celebrated it throughout his music and beyond Linda's death in 1998. So um, sometimes people ask how, if you love somebody that much, how could you possibly remarry? I tend to think he remarried on the rebound the first time. He was so grief stricken and couldn't imagine his life without a soulmate. That one didn't work out, but the current one, his marriage to Nancy does seem to be perfect for him. So it, yes, it is all about love. Love is all you need. And even in a song like Paperback Writer, which isn't ostensibly about love, not overtly about love, actually there is love in there too. It's it's a craving of for love of a different kind. And that brings us uh, to your final selection, which is one of uh, John's uh, compositions um, and in fact John's first love song and a song that he referred to as a silly love song in one of his last interviews in, in 1980 from uh, A Hard Day's Night. There it if is. I fell, mm. Which has a very very different uh, significance to you. Yeah it does. Um, in December 1991 my dad fell under a train at London Bridge and he lost his writing arm. It it was a horrific accident. And I can remember that night because I was at home with with my eldest daughter, who's just a little girl. And my brother and my sisters were all in, in their homes. And my mother called all of us one by one. And all she said was, your father's had an accident. Um, we we don't really know what's happened. I want you to stay there where you are and I will call you and let you know what will happen next. So, of course, the obvious question was, where is he? He was in Guy's Hospital, close, very close to London Bridge Station. And guess what we all did? We all got in our cars and drove there from various parts of the country. So I got my little girl out of bed and bundled her in the back of the car. And we all turned up at the hospital sort of within an hour of each other. We were all there. And he was in surgery for a very long time, for about 11 hours overnight. And I have found in my life that when something tragic happens, and we all go through these these things that rock our lives and throw us off the side and disequilibrate and disrupt us and upset us to the point that we lose our reason. We can't think straight. It's a very, very big thing to get over, especially when, as I did, you love your dad so much. And my personal therapy has always been to reach for a song. And in the first moments, there wasn't a song that I could commit to my head and go over and over it and and try and spread the grief in some way that I could deal with it. And I was in the hospital waiting in this horrible little room, waiting for my dad to come back from the theater so that we could go in and see him. And I was trying to rehearse what I would say to him. And I was terrified of seeing him. And I kept saying to myself, how can you be terrified of seeing dad? You've been seeing dad your whole life. He, he, he's your closest person in your life. How, how would you be afraid? And I was afraid of going in there and seeing it was real. And this song popped into my head. I know obviously only the first three words of the title would be, and, and the first three words of the first line of the song, it, it that's all that's relevant but it said everything it said everything about what happened and again it's a love song so that aspect of it 
was quite um, abstract, but it didn't matter because it expressed what had happened if I fell, which he did. But here is all this love. Here are all these people here to to support you and to be here for you, despite what had happened. And we don't hear this song very often on the radio, do we? But every now and again, it comes around. Or I might play the album or something. But every time I hear it, I'm cast right back there to that night in Guy's Hospital, waiting to go in and see my dad. And the melody of If I Fell going round and round in my head. And it helped. It got me through it. And that's I'm why sure John would have been delighted to know that yeah. one of his songs had comforted you. In oh, that way. very much. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm mean, still very emotional. You can tell from me. But tell, yeah. it's, it's a gorgeous melody. Um, it, it's got that funny sort of structure, hasn't it? That 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 sort of opening statement, and then you've got your sort of basic A A B A song structure with the wonderful bridge, and. The harmonies are so close that they are Everly Brothers close. Hmm. I believe they sang into the same microphone when they Perhaps. recorded this. And the harmonies are just heartbreakingly gorgeous. Um, how could it not move anybody? It would take a stone heart, wouldn't it? But you're, you're contrasting that with the fact that John was essentially writing about an affair and, and hoping that the, the next relationship was going to be stronger and better than the, the previous one. So, yeah, uh... yeah, it, yeah, there's a lot of irony there. But also, I think the other Beatles ridiculed this song quite a lot because it was blatantly John's first go at a mm. at a ballad type song, really. And they made fun of him for that. And I think a couple of times when they were on the road and in the US and they would perform this, they would introduce it as if I fell over and things like that. They would make make fun of the song and make fun of him. But he did his fair share of ribbing as well. And and actually you'd have to alleviate the boredom of playing those same songs on stage night after night with me. Well, John got his own back because in the film, of course, he serenades Ringo, so. Yes, yeah, he does. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's a faultless song for me. I, you know, when I listen to it now, I think because I'm listening with different ears, we do as adults. Um, it's a flattish vocal of John's, isn't it? It's but it, but it's lifted by the the harmonies, which to me are perfect. Fantastic, Leslie Ann. Thank you very much for sharing your memories today. Thanks. Take care. Thank you. Bye bye.